I want to thank Jose and his team for inviting me this year again. It's really a pleasure to be here, and I'm glad to see so many people are here so early in the morning, especially in Miami, where most people are sleeping on a Saturday morning, as you can imagine. So I'm going to talk about, these are my disclosures. I'm going to talk about PE, and when I talked to Jose about this, he wanted me to really kind of just give a, a quick overview of some of the devices that are available for PE therapy. I think this is some of the basic stuff we all know. There's about 600,000 to about a million people each year uh, that are uh, showing up to hospitals with pulmonary embolism. We know the one-year mortality is really the third leading cause of cardiovascular death in the United States. And when you look at the studies that are out there right now, you know, the 30-day all-cause mortality by risk level is about 6 to 15% for submassive PE. We're looking at a higher percentage, 25 to 50% for massive PE. And despite optimal therapy, a lot of these patients still develop post-PE syndrome, dyspnea, exercise limita limitation, reduced quality of life, CTEP or chronic thromboembolic pulmonary artery hypertension, about one to 5% still develop that despite uh, optimal treatment. And obviously, if you have somebody that comes uh, with an acute PE and doesn't get treatment at all, these patients really progress to right heart failure and death. So how is PE classified today? Well, Obviously, the majority of patients that show up to the hospitals in, in, in the acute care or ER settings are really low risk. These are the patients who have acute PE, they're hemodynamically stable, they don't have any cardiac dysfunction, and really their, their cardiac uh, biomarkers are normal. On the other hand, when you look at the, the next bigger class of patients that show up to the hospital, which we see a lot of being in a big system, just like Tino and I'm sure many of you, is the patient with acute PE who's hemodynamically stable but presents really with, with, with strain, right? They show up with RV dilation, hypokinesis, um, cardiac dysfunction, uh, and elevated troponin and BNP, which is really an indicator of, of ischemia, right? Right ventricular subendothelial ischemia. And so these are the patients that we're trying to tease out and figure out what to do. They're patients that are kind of, they're on a little bit of oxygen, maybe a little uncomfortable, but they're basically, you know, sitting in, the, in their hospital bed, kind of just waiting. And we're treating these obviously with anticoagulation, but what's really the next step? Obviously, the next uh, big category is the patients that show up with massive or high-risk PE. It's a smaller percentage, 5 to 10%. These, again, are patients with, a, with acute PE. They have cardiac dysfunction, elevated enzymes, uh, and so forth. But these are patients who are now hemodynamically unstable. And you can see that oftentimes they're on pressure support, respiratory support. They may be intubated. In our system, these patients actually rapidly go to surgical embolectomy. Uh, they get a sternotomy. Oftentimes they may need ECMO as well. So the category we're focusing on is obviously we're talking about submassive PE patients. What do we have available? So what can be done today? Well, obviously, we've got anticoagulation and IV TPA. We have studies that show that those do pretty well. But we also have catheter-directed thrombolysis, endovascular embolectomies. We have all these large devices now to rapidly remove thrombus from the pulmonary arteries in, in a quick fashion. And then obviously surgical embolectomy, which is a great surgery, been around a long time and in, the, and in experienced hands, patients do uh, very well as we've seen in our own center. We're gonna obviously focus on endovascular embolectomy and some of the devices that are available. The first one to really hit the market was the ECOS endovascular system. This is really a, a, a catheter system that has a generator that produces ultrasound waves or energy. You basically have five French catheters that are placed into each pulmonary artery. It has an ultrasound fiber within it. So not only are you infusing TPA, but you're delivering ultrasound energy. And what that does is that breaks up the fibrin strands, increases the surface area of the TPA, and really allows you to get rapid clot uh, uh, dissolving and, and use lower doses of TPA. And, and this is really what it looks like. Here's an example. You can see here we have a classic submassive PE patient. We've got the ECOS catheters, one on the right side, one on the left side. Uh, and then are you guys able to play these videos by any chance? And uh, I put the pre-pulmonary arteriograms on top and then the post on the bottom. And what I'm trying to focus you on is that pre-intervention, you can see that a lot of the peripheral arterial vasculature uh, is not there. And once we infused TPA for about 12 hours, brought the patient back and reassessed them, 
I think you can see that the pulmonary arterial vasculature is really increased. You see more of it, more blood vessels are, are shown and the flow is better. And this patient went on to uh, improve their cardiac dysfunction, improve their cardiac enzymes uh, result, uh, re were reduced and, and resolved. And they ultimately uh, had a reduction in their elevated PA pressures. So what do we have shortly thereafter? So a few years later, large bore embolectomy really became very popular in the setting of submassive PE. We're talking about two really main companies, Inari and Penumbra. And the advantages of this is that you could do surgical embolectomy without a sternotomy. Uh, you could get rapid on the table, cardiovascular improvement. There was really no risk for intracranial hemorrhage or major bleeding, obviously, uh, unless you had a, a complication related to the device in the heart or in the pulmonary artery. And you still didn't burn any bridges. You could still give catheter-directed thrombolysis depending on what's going on. The first one to really gain popularity and traction was the Inari flow retriever system. This uh, consisted of really two different systems. You have a suction embolectomy catheter, which comes uh, in 16, 20, and 24 French. Uh, and it also had uh, flow retriever discs, as they're called, which are really cages or baskets. And these are the newer generations one, newer generation discs that they have available, which really can kind of trap uh, or capture clot, which you can then pull out. Very similar to uh, stroke thrombectomy, if you think about it that way. And this is what this device really looks like. This is the Inari flow retriever system. You can see this is the manual suction component where you have a catheter, you have it adjacent to clot, and you're basically put, uh, performing really a manual embolectomy in this case. And that's how you're able to remove the thrombus. The next part of this uh, that they had was really the flow retriever discs. So if you can't get the clot out that way, then you've got some cages or baskets, which are called flow retriever discs, which you can use to trap the clot. And then this would allow you to really, you know, pull out more organized thrombus uh, and, and get a better result in terms of clot uh, resolution. So here's an example of that. And you can see here again, another patient with submassive PE. We have a PERT team, which is a pulmonary embolism response team. That team really has a discussion uh, about should we intervene on somebody with submassive PE? Because you can imagine there's not a lot of data out there on when you should intervene and what device you should be using. So in this case, we, we had a patient that everybody thought really needed to uh, undergo intervention. You can see the, the hypoperfusion or the lack of pulmonary vessels in the right upper lobe, right middle lobe, the lingula, and the left lower lobe. And so this is the initial pulmonary arteriogram. You can see here now we've got the clot, uh, the flow retriever device. In this case, we use uh, the flow retriever disc. And then we were able to really rapidly remove thrombus from both pulmonary arteries. You get resolution of the PA pressures. Uh, sometimes you see a little bit of a change. Sometimes you see a, a great change. But the idea is that you're looking for hemodynamic improvement on the table, respiratory status, cardiac function, oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can see here, I'm showing you the right lung that now that right upper lobe, right middle lobe has much more robust perfusion uh, compared to the pre-intervention angiogram. You can see the left side, same thing. You've got a significant improvement in terms of the flow and the patient was symptomatically better. Next uh, to hit the market, uh, which was around for a long time, but then really became popular when they developed the 12 French catheters, the Penumbra system. It has an engine that creates really high pressure suction or vacuum. Uh, and as a result, uh, when they release their Lightning 12 uh, device, it has some software that allows it to shut off when it's in flowing blood, and it, uh, it turns on when it's uh, in non-flowing blood. And so that really, you can imagine, reduces your, your blood loss during the case. And here's an example of that. You can see the device turning on and off. You can see that it's, it's aspirating from this. It turns on. When there's flow, it turns off, and it really can rapidly remove thrombus. And, uh, my understanding is there'll be a Lightning 16, which is a 16 French catheter coming out shortly, and I think that'll make a big difference. And here's a case of that. You can hear, again, another patient with submassive PE. You can see uh, large thrombus within the left pulmonary artery extending into the descending branch. And you can see, I put an arrow there to show you really this kind of you know, toothpaste-looking filling defect within the left pulmonary artery. Uh, you can see here we're using the penumbra device. We're using, you know, to really aspirate this stuff. We're able to get most of that clot out. And then ultimately, you can see that there has been a, a rapid resolution uh, and improvement of flow post-aspiration. Uh, you can see the next day you've got uh, a pretty good-looking CTA. Obviously, we're looking more for symptomatic improvement in these patients, you know, and 
hemodynamic improvement and not pretty pictures. So our approach to PE and specifically submassive PE has really become more uh, aggressive over the past, I would say, five, six years compared to years before. You know, we're definitely using bigger devices and, and, and there's more equipment available to treat these patients in this category. But, you know, iatrogenic injury in terms of causing arrhythmias, injury to the chordae tendinae, the heart, the pulmonary vessels, and so forth is, is actually increased because we're using more of these. And so training and expertise uh, really makes a difference. And we still don't have a consensus on which endovascular device to use and which has the best outcomes. So that's something we'll have to tease out over the next few years. Thank you. Great, Srini. So Srini, uh, you can take it from right there. Um, how do you decide who, who's submassive, and who's massive, and if it's massive, is it ever too late to, to go for it? But what are the real criteria where, you know, you submassive, we're going we're gonna to benefit from intervention versus anticoagulation? Yeah, basically, if you look at the low risk category, these are all the patients that are doing fine. They've got a QPE, they have no right ventricular strain, no right ventricular dilatation, no cardiac dysfunction. Their enzymes are normal, so that's the low risk category. 70% of patients, they go on to get anticoagulation, et cetera. The submassive category are really the same category of patients. They're hemodynamically stable, but now you've got cardiac dysfunction. They've got their PA pressures are so high that now that right ventricle can't pump against that obstruction, and so you get RV dilation, you get hypokinesis, wall motion abnormalities, you get elevation of the troponin and the BNP, which is really indicative of, of ischemia of the subendothelial layer of the right ventricle. So those are automatically in the submassive category. Those are the ones that get really a, a pretty you know, big discussion amongst the pulmonology, the interventionalist, CT surgery, and so forth. Right. So the point being, they've come in and you've got time to get Correct. this work up. So Correct. who are the people that are going to crash on you while you guys yeah. are having your discussion? Yeah. The ones that basically, just like I described, but the difference is they have massive PE and they're now hemodynamically unstable. Their blood pressure is low. They've had a drop of greater than 40 millimeters of uh, you know, mercury uh, over a 15, 20 minute period. Some of these patients are intubated right away. They've, they're on pressure support. Uh, they may need ECMO during the intervention because you know, just putting these devices up there, you can imagine you've already got outflow obstruction. You've got elevated PA pressures. You put another device in there and then what ends up happening is now they decompensate even more. And so these are patients that in our center, we have decided that it's just better for them to go to the OR because they're, they're probably going to need ECMO uh, while they're getting uh, fixed with surgical, in terms of surgical embolectomy. So it's really low risk, submassive, massive. Submassive, we've got time. You know, unless they're in the teetering into the massive, then we got to think quick. But if they're not and they're in that intermediate risk within that submassive category, we got time to discuss it, talk about it, figure out what's the best way, see how they're doing. Maybe they improve on anticoagulation alone. The massive category, like we talked about, they're unstable, they're crashing, they're burning. Those are the ones that go straight to the OR very quickly in our center. But I think you bring up a really good point, uh, both Trini and Jose, and that is the goal is when they come in to identify, almost like in DVT, right? You want to identify those that may go to post-traumatic syndrome. In PE, it's a little bit more acute. You want to, in the first, you know, the first kind of encounter, you want to get an idea, is this person going to be someone who's going to decompensate in the next three to four hours? And I can kind of hopefully prevent that by a rapid treatment. And I think that's something we're trying to learn a little bit more. Obviously, we have these factors that we look at, strain, and we look at, you know, blood pressure and this and that. But because we know once they fall into the massive category, the more mortality and morbidity goes way up. So you're, you're hoping to stop, identify those patients and treat them before they get to that. I think that's really where the treatment paradigm is really important. And, you know, and then we go back to those sub, to the submass and intermediate, where then you're saying, hey, I'm hoping to prevent you from having, you know, now we talk about post-PE syndrome, right? There's studies now that were done with quality of life measurements of what have you one year out and six months out people from PE. And we know that they can become having significant symptoms. And can you... Now, how do you identify those patients and try to treat them? You know, and one thing we're starting to see now, Jose, is that in these patients in the submassive category, you know, I didn't go into the detail because I know a lot of the people, you know, that come to this meeting don't uh, fix or treat patients with PE, but there's low, intermediate, and high risk even within the submassive category. And what we're seeing now is that when we're looking at these CTAs, 
if we're seeing significant RV dilation and we're seeing thickening of the left ventricular wall and it's relatively decompressed, meaning that blood can't get there because the PA pressures are so high, that these are really patients that are teetering to become massive. And, and those are the ones that we're trying to get to much more quickly from an endovascular approach. The massive ones, no question, we found work better in our system of like 2,500 beds or so, you know, level one trauma center, that's better that they just go to surgical embolectomy right away. So what about um, CT angiography? Does that correlate well with angiography, pulmonary angiography? I mean, when you look at one, you pretty much see what you see in the other. And what I'm getting at is that if we're missing a lot of people in that lower and subgroup that might not qualify as a better angiographic diagnosis than um, the other factors. Yeah, so I that think. Contribute? Yeah, I, I mean, I think at this point we know that CT angiography is as good as pulmonary artery angiography. If not, if if anything, it may be more sensitive. I mean, I'm Tino and I are well. I won't, I won't say Tino, but I'm old enough, you know, where we did we did pulmonary arteriograms for everybody that had a PE. And I can tell you for sure that you don't pick up as much of the PE on a pulmonary angiogram as you do on a CTA. The CTA is definitely much more sensitive, much more specific. It tells you about other things that are happening, pericardial effusions, pneumonias, pneumothorax, fractures, et cetera. So that is clearly the gold standard at this point. And I think we're not missing PE from an imaging standpoint using CTA. At, uh, no, I think you're 100% right. And I think, you know, we still have to think of CT as a, as a picture, right? It gives you a one snapshot and the patient is dynamic. And I think that's why we look at other things. I don't, I don't think we're missing the diagnosis and we're getting an idea, hey, there may be right ventricular strain and what have you. But I think more than that, it's very hard to get from CT. We're trying, right? Now you can use perfusion uh, analysis of the CT and you can see how, how much of the lung is being perfused and you can get some data like that, more of a functional assessment. But I think that's why we rely on troponins and patients of vital signs and because there's so much more than just the picture of the CT. But in terms of where the yeah. clot is and, and that, I think it, it's very accurate. And I think the main thing is, you know, we have good data that we know anticoagulation works in low risk patients. We know that IV TPA, meaning 100 milligrams over two hours given intravenously works in, in, a, good, in a, a significant percentage of patients, but we don't have good randomized controlled trials on do these endovascular devices make a difference in terms of outcomes and, and ultimately later quality of life. We like to think, just like in the leg, are we preventing PTS? You know, we know the ATTRACT trial, which, you know, was, a, what, I think a 10-year study, but when you really look at the data is that they were using older techniques, older data early on, or older uh, devices early on. A lot of the newer devices were not incorporated. So it, it was very hard to tease it out. The same thing here is that, are we really preventing CTEP? Are we preventing post-PE syndrome long-term? Again, we don't have good data that it makes a difference when we do these fancy interventions with these devices, but the sub-massive category is the hardest one to figure out so far. Excellent talk uh, and discussion. Uh, one question, uh, of course, we don't have data, competitive data between the three major uh, devices for extraction, but uh, in your institute, what is your approach? Uh, which device that you prefer over other in what circumstances? So, you know, I'll be honest with you, we've had a, a pretty, you know, interesting debate and discussion with our cardiologists and our intensivists, our critical care pulmonary physicians and so forth. And, you know, we're constantly going over the data, the information just in our center and across the country. You know, there's a PERT consortium that tries to look at this stuff, as you're probably aware, and tries to figure out all this, this, this information. And one thing we're seeing is that when we have patients where the PA pressures are 50, 60 and higher, that using some of the larger devices, say an Inari device, uh, is, is much more occlusive than using a smaller device, right? So like a penumbra, if you're using a, a Cat 8, which is 8 French or a 12 French. And so what we're starting to tease out is, if we have somebody who's really teetering and borderline, should we use this device because it's smaller and we get less obstruction of the pulmonary outflow tract? Shouldn't we? And that's something we just don't know. We're trying to figure it out. And so I don't have a good answer for you on which device. I can tell you that morphologically or structurally, if we see peripheral clot that's small, 
we may go with catheter directed thrombolysis because it'll take care of those small clots that are peripheral and hard to get to. If we have large saddle embolus or large big occlusive clots at the right and left pulmonary arteries where they branch, then we're going to be using some of the larger devices, say the Inari penumbras, et cetera. And I'm sure Tino has. I think you're right on exactly well, how we, you know, we have all three type of treatment uh, algorithms available. And I think we need to study, we need to understand which one may be better for each particular patient. And that's why we're involved in this trials. That's why we're doing as many trials as we can. That's why I think being in registry is really important now because we need to learn, you know, we have one randomized control trial that had like 45 patients. So it's like, we need to get better data and we need to understand which, you know, what, what are we treating and, and then know, have all your tools. And hopefully we can, as we progress, you know, figure stuff out like, Hey, high pulmonary pressures, let's try, you know, let's go with something smaller, or maybe I need to do lytic in these patients because I'm trying to get more distal perfusion. Again, those are all anecdotes. We, we need to know uh, how are we treating these and what's the data. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, and, you know, even though we've got, I think, the FLASH trial and the STRIKE PE trial, these are trials looking at Inari and Penumbra, which, you know, Tino's group and we're, we're part of as well, is that we really need a head-to-head, -head, right? Ecos versus Inari versus Penumbra versus whatever else is coming online or is out there versus anticoagulation and IVTPA and say, all right, in the submassive category, let's randomize these. But, you know, nobody's going to do that, right? I mean, that's going to be a tough trial. So, thank right. you. Question. All right. Do you, guys, do you guys have any data on post PE syndrome in relation to size of embolus or rather than length of time that the embolus remain, remained in place? Teleologically, if you have more distal emboli with more chance for fibrosis, you would think you'd get pulmonary artery hypertension. And I understand that the acute large clot puts a strain on the heart and the cardiovascular system. But the question is in terms of post PE, is there really a correlation with the size of the embolus or the length of time uh, that the embolus remains in place? Like if you depend on anticoagulation alone, waiting for clot to be lysed naturally, does that set you up for a greater risk of PE syndrome? I mean, I think that is the question. You're right on. We, we're so early in this process. All we have is one study, the LOP study that looked at and did basically surveys of patients six months out and you know that's all we have right now so that's those are the kind of things we need to do you're now going to see trials coming out following these patients six months we're now having trials following these patients one year so that data is going to come but i think you're probably right uh -huh.